Thank you, Kathy. Thank you all for having me here. Normally, uh, the Dutch send off crews to the UK to learn from what's happening here, all the fresh expressions and stuff. Uh, so for some mysterious reason, they have decided to invite a Dutchman to come to the UK to do some teaching here. Wonderful. Thank you for that. I hope you won't be disappointed too much. Um, bits and parts of what I'm going to say today, I've been sharing with different audiences over the years. So you may have heard something of this, um, but um, what I'd like to begin with, with is, um, in addition to what, what, what um, Kathy said uh, by way of introdu introduction, uh, I'm also a practitioner. So I've been in, involved in, in several church plants uh, in the Netherlands uh, since the early 1990s, actually. And um, currently I'm involved in a church plant in Amsterdam for some years already. Uh, about 70 people or so. Um, and Amsterdam is, is one of these places that's very post-Christian, very, very post-Christendom. Um, I think on an average, well, let's say that the church-going population of Amsterdam, that would say at least once a month or so, would be 3% probably, and half of them would be immigrant Christians from Africa mostly. Uh, and the other half would be almost all well into their retirement. Um, so uh, it's very difficult to find a Christian, an, let's say a native-born Dutch Christian below 65, 70 in Amsterdam. Uh, that's basically the, 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 the context. So every Christian who's younger, and I hope you have guessed from my appearance that I am one of those, uh, <laughs> is, uh, is a, rare, a rare duck in, in Amsterdam. Um, Anyway, um, so that also raises the question, if you, if you start a church there and try to do mission, evangelism, social ministry and all that, uh, what's the purpose of it? What, we, what do we try to achieve in a city like that when you're such a tiny fraction of the population without much expectation to make a big splash in a city like that? Um, now, I've, I've just put some quotes on your handout just to get you in the mood. Um, and I hope you found your handout. If, if, if you're not, uh, Johnny is handing out some more. So, two of these quotes are from a time in Europe when church leaders and theologians started to discover that, uh, let's say, the, the tapestry of European Christendom started to, to wear out, to be undone. Um, and what you often see in times like that is a sort of counter-reaction. Um, when things are starting to seep through your fingers, then you start to say things like, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ does not cry mine. Like Abraham Kuyper, the famous Dutch prime minister, journalist, whatnot, uh, said in 1880. And then a Roman Catholic, I mean a Pope even, Leo the Thirteenth, um, in his uh, encyclical Immortale Dei, uh, put it even more in a, in a more nostalgic way, almost. Once upon a time, there was once a time when states were governed by the philosophy of the gospel. Then it was that the power and divine virtue of Christian wisdom had diffused itself throughout the laws, institutions, and morals of the people, permeating all ranks and relations of civil society. That's how he looked at at Christendom. Um, and, and, and wouldn't it be nice if, if, if it was a society like that, wouldn't it? I mean, Christian wisdom diffused all ranks of society, Nigel. You would love that. Uh, but that, that is sort of the shade, uh, the memory, the cultural memory that hovers, hovers over all sorts of mission that we're doing in a post-Christian age. What do we try to achieve? Um, and if it's not this, this kind of nostalgia that was even sort of invoked by Leslie Newbegin when he returned from India, the very religious India, and came back to Europe. And then he asked the question, can the West be converted? And my first response would be, what does that mean? <laughs> a converted West. I mean, we had a converted West for centuries uh, in Christendom. And it was, not all that, it was not all bad. I mean, maybe even most of it was good. And yet, most of us, I suppose, are a bit wary of going back there. But what then? That is one of the questions that has been 
bothering me, worrying me um, um, over the years, and, and part of my um, studies are focused on exactly that. What do we want to do in this particular culture? A culture that has been transformed and converted for ages with very mixed results. But can mission avoid Christendom? If we take mission seriously, if we really want to have an impact, if we want people to see converted, if we want to see institutions being changed, if we want to see society transformed, then what's the end result? What's the dream behind it? Is, is Christendom not a logical and desired outcome of mission, at least theologically? A Christianized world. Now, that is, as far as I can tell, and part of what I'm going to say is based on a book that, that will come out this year, Pilgrims and Priests. I hope it will come out. I still have to find a publisher, but anyway. Um, <laughs> so if you have any ideas about that. Um, so, so what I do in the book, among other things, is to analyze uh, a number of ecclesi uh, missional ecclesiological models or uh, ways of speaking about church and mission in the 20th century. And there are m many more than I've put on the handout. But just to give you an impression of what, what's often happening, uh, a lot of what I see in all sorts of talk about church and mission in, in the late modern West in post-Christendom uh, societies is amounts to denial, I would say. So there's a lot of talk about we're still very Christian, um, Christian values have permeated our societies, many laws are still based on, 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 on Christian <coughs> intuitions and so on. Or uh, when the latest figures came out uh, in, in the Netherlands on church going and, 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 and church membership, uh, which show continuous decline since the Second World War, then there was uh, this typical response from a more, more or less mainstream Protestant pastor who said, well, there's still a lot of spirituality in our societies. I, I, and I always think, what do you mean by that? Well, he meant, for example, horse riding. Horse riding is, is, is a way of spirituality as well, he said. And, um, uh, and to an extent, I would say, this is sort of homeopathic approach of, 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 of the folk church, of the national church idea. We've been so... We've gotten so used to the idea of a national church, a national Christian identity, that when this seeps away, we try to find, to redefine this kind of stuff, Christianity, into ever vague, vaguer terms like religion or spirituality, uh, in order to keep everyone under the same religious umbrella as long as we can. Sort of, um, sort of zombie life of, 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 of the folk church or the national church. Horse riding is spirituality as well. And of course gardening and so on also, but... Isn't that not, doesn't, doesn't that amount to, to fooling ourselves if we, we really want to make that point? Anyway, we can discuss that later. Um, what you see more often, especially among the more, let's say, orthodox, conservative Christians, evangelical Christians or whatever, is, is a form of restoration. They tend to acknowledge that culture is no longer Christian. Maybe it's never been Christian in the first place. Anyway, uh, but we need to, to get it back somehow. And then there is church growth-driven approaches and, and transformation-driven approaches. Um, Donald McGavern, I suppose you've heard his name, or come across his name now and then, um, the guru of church, church growth in the 20th century. And in his book, um, um, Understanding Church Growth, first published in 1980, he says the chief and irreplaceable purpose of mission is church growth. Now, start to think about that. And maybe it's very familiar to you. Maybe it's your own motto, so to speak. I mean, well, yeah, that's, that's what mission is about, isn't it? Um, if that is true, then when, when will mission have reached its purpose? So when will mission be fulfilled? Well, basically, if, if the church cannot grow any longer, right? If it's, and basically, if, if, the church, if, if the world has become church, that, I would say, would be the intended purpose of, of the church growth philosophy. So a growing church corresponds to a disappearing world. Uh, and in a sense, this, this, there is a dream in the background of getting the world back uh, within the Christian fold, to Christianize the world again by individual conversions. Um, the chief and irreplaceable purpose of mission is church growth, numerical church growth. Anyway, lots of things can be said about that, but just give it a thought. There is a sort of correspondence between a disappearing world here and a growing church. Um, now, many evangelicals, post-evangelicals and so on, have become a bit weary about church growth 
obsessions and always talk about conversions and, and numerical growth and they tend to turn towards transformation ideals, changing the world. Um, in earlier days they would call that social ministry but change and transformation are much cooler words so, so we use those. Um, it's about transformation um, and you read that in a lot of literature I found. Um, so, for example, this book by Samuel and Sugden, fundamentally, transformation is the transformation of communities to reflect kingdom values. And although this is a very nice phrase, and I, I love it to an extent, again, my question would be, so what does a community like that look like? I mean, what, what do we mean by that? Um, and what I often find when people talk about transformation they tend to keep the actual results of transformation a bit vague. Um, even, for example, when you read through the, the books of the famous N.T. Wright, I suppose he's famous here too, um, uh, there's a lot about transformation and learning from, basically from neo-Calvinists, from Kuiper. When he calls himself reformed, he would, I would say it's neo-reformed, the, the Kuiperian view of transforming institutions and so on. All fair and square, but what's what does it look like, a community like that? And didn't we have such a community for centuries, actually? A community that was uh, transformed to reflect kingdom values. Look again at the quote by Pope Leo XIII. We had a society like that once, at least in the view of their contemporaries. Um, sometimes I ask my students, could you think of the most Christian place in your country? Village, town, city, whatever. I have, an, I have a group of international students, and so they start to think about their Bible Belt areas, and then you see them. Eyes brightening, yes, oh, we, we, I get one. And then my next question is always this one Would you want to live there? <laughs> um, and then, <laughs> yeah, well, sometimes responses like this one, sometimes a bit more embarrassed. Yeah, well, Maybe that's not the best place to live, in, in a way. And that's a weird thing, isn't it? When you really start to think about a world that is completely transformed by Christian values, we immediately start to think about, what is it, Sabbath obver observance and stuff like that, or swimming pools closed on Sundays, or, um, or other sort of... the kind of stuff that is, that is part of social order, basically. I mean, communities have to decide about these things, and Christian communities have done that. So when we talk about transformation, we immediately start have to think about power, for example. So if, if, if a, a, a Christianized social order is the purpose of mission, what do we do with those minorities, or even majorities perhaps, who will not comply to the Christian social order? Uh, how do, will we do that differently from what usually those in power have done always <coughs> with minorities? Um, I don't have the answer. But I'm not sure whether I would want a completely Christianized social order, actually. For all sorts of reasons. Uh, among them, reasons from the past. So, um, and then of course, you, you read a lot of nice, sort of, well, almost uh, uh, denial or, 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 or counter reactions in all sorts of mission literature that, that say, well, we need transformation, but we shouldn't manage the world. Well, again, I would say, how do you transform a world without managing it? So, anyway, narrowing down the question, um, let me rephrase it. So what does it mean to be a missional Christian community, usually a small missional Christian uh, community, in a society like a city of Amsterdam or, or here in, in the UK and, and several places, where your mission is not likely to have great impact in terms of conversions, in terms of social change or whatever, uh, what if the world just remains the world? That's my question where I depart from. So if we, if we leave aside, if we abandon the dream of Christendom, even implicitly, then what is the dream? What if this dream is really over, this dream of Christendom, then what do we want to achieve? Now, some things I want to talk with you about uh, are on the handout. The first is instrumentalization and doxology, doxology, sort of re rethinking this theologically, exile and diaspora, and priesthood. These would be my key terms 
when I start to think about a truly post-Christendom mission. Now first, again, start to think about those ideals that uh, aim at restoration, church growth, transformation, and so on. One of the, the problems I have with that is basically pragmatic. I don't see how that will happen in Amsterdam, ever. Uh, they've tried that for centuries. Uh, who are we to think that we will succeed where so many before us failed? And isn't it actually a very unhealthy dynamic when ever new generations of Christians, ever new generations of church planters, pioneers, will think, well, we will fix the job where others failed? Is that really what it is about? When we came to Amsterdam uh, doing our church plant, uh, a Christian newspaper uh, headlined, uh, the kingdom of God is coming to Amsterdam. <laughs> we protested. Because, uh, you know, many faithful Christians, mostly from mainline denominations, had stayed there when the evangelicals had all left and so on. And now, uh, when they had rediscovered the city and, and tried to, to do mission there, then all of a sudden the kingdom of God would appear there. I think it's quite arrogant to think that. So, so all these ideas of, of doing a better job, finally Christianizing the city, maybe, uh, maybe have, to, have to be abandoned. So this, this, this also, I think, affects our spirituality. When, you really, when Christianity, Christian mission is really about transforming societies, then to an extent we also need to be better people, right? Um, better scientists, better teachers, better mothers and fathers, and so on. Um, because we need to make a difference. What if those non-Christians can do a better job than we? in transforming the world. That would be sad, wouldn't it? If you can do the same things without prayer, without believing in God. And what you often see with these transformation ideals, this, this idea of, home, of church inside out also, but we can talk about that. Hukendijk has sort of a reputation in the Netherlands. Um, so this whole idea of, of, of turning the church inside out, transforming society, going there uh, to, to, to transform things, um, may also introduce a sort of unhealthy competition between Christians and non-Christians and actually breed doubt among Christians. Because if you see those people around you are not Christians, and in Amsterdam it's the vast majority, and it's a very ide idealistic city also, so I know a lot of non-Christians who do a much better job than most Christians are now in, in transforming the city and, and working for ecological ideals or of social justice or whatever. Um, good vegetarians, all of them. Um, <laughs> veganists even um, then Christians when they see that they can go two ways basically they can deny that non-Christians do a better job which is not a healthy thing you can only do that when you close yourself off for real context real relationships or more often you start to doubt what your faith what kind of difference makes my faith anyway so so um, uh, if if your faith, if your ministry, if your mission is about transformation, if it's been justified, so to speak, by the transformation it brings, then you're in for much problems spiritually, I would say. There's a lot of frustration and doubt from this comp coming from this competition with the world. We should be better, and so on. So, so um, I would say this, is, this all amounts to a sort of instrumentalization of mission. The problem here may be this, that um, in church growth, the church growth ideal and, and the transformation ideal, the good works of mission, like say, witnessing to Christ, inviting people to follow Jesus, uh, evangelism, uh, creating food banks, working for social ministry, and, uh, social justice and so on, uh, all these things tend to become justified by the results. So um, evangelism is okay, but it should lead to church growth. Uh, making food banks is okay, but it should lead to transformation of society or to at least, at the very least, very grateful people. <laughs> um, <laughs> we want to see some effect, wouldn't we? So, so um, uh, if that, all that doesn't happen, then what is it good for anyway? So the instrumentalization of mission, I think, is a very unhealthy thing. And, and so the question is, and, and one of the questions that, that kept me occupied during writing my book were two Bible texts, actually. Um, uh, the one is from Luke 15. In this, what Jesus says, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, statistically, that doesn't make a splash, does it? I mean, one sinner? Only one? 
Uh, you, don't, you won't reach the black figures with one sinner. Um, if, especially in, in, in a post-Christendom culture like ours, where for every sinner, every, people, every person becomes a Christian, 25 walk away through the back door. So that, that's... Can you be rejoicing about one? How do you do that in a, in a situation where evangelism does not have much impact? Or another text that, that kept me busy was this one from Galatians 6. Let us not become weary in doing good. Now, if all your mission is about transforming the world, you will become weary very soon, especially in post-Christendom society. That would be my take on it. I mean, maybe not in Brazil or China, where everything is going great with, with mission, but, but in the Netherlands, you will become weary, very exhausted, very soon. It was all about transformation. So what's the secret here? And I think uh, the key for a missional spirituality in a post-Christendom setting is this, that we should learn to get rid of the instrumentalization of mission and instead focus on a doxological approach. That would be my guess, I think. Um, and again, we can talk about that, but what do I mean with doxological or doxology? Well, basically this. It's about worship, right? I'm not, I'm not talking about rooms full of clapping and, and shouting people and so on. That can be part of it, but it's more like a structure of life. So the doxological approach of life, well, if, if Christians do doxology, worship, I would say what we do is this. We say there is one who is not good for anything, who is basically good, period. That's what, what it is to worship God, right? Um, we don't say, we don't, do not instrumentalize him towards greater good, let's say wealth or health or whatever. Now we say, God is good, period. That's worship, I would say. Now, so too, I would say, with all the things that are done in his name. Uh, evangelism, social service, justice, etc. Um, they are good in themselves. I sometimes compare it to raising children. Um, we are in the age that two of our children have left the nest, the youngest is still at home. And sometimes you start to evaluate yourself. You shouldn't do that too often, but sometimes we do that. So we, we look each other in the eyes and say, how have we done this? Um, and with that, we mean the full picture as Christian parents. So when they, when they are babies, you, you, no, you need to put something in and something comes out and you need to wipe it off and so on. You protect them, you bring them to school, you, 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 all these things that loving parents do. You love them, you, you, sometimes you have to punish them a little bit and so on. Uh, but also, um, uh, as Christian parents, we took them with us to church and we read them from the children's Bible and, and later on from the real Bible and so on. Um, so, um, <laughs> we did those things. We prayed with them. Now, many, many of you are parents, I suppose, and many of you have children the same age as we have. So, and many of you probably will have experienced that your children came to you and said, we love all you've done for us. Um, but this faith thing, well, not for me, thank you. Um, we've seen, we've experienced your love in it and so on, and, and we see that you have done it for the best, for the best interest, uh, and best intentions and so on, but we're just not into that. Um, now, the question is, of course, is everything you've done as a parent, loving them, protecting them, uh, feeding them, getting them to school and so on, have all these things of love been rendered undone, so to speak, by the fact that they're not going to church anymore? They're not praying anymore. Well, I think to ask the question is answering it. I would say that would be rubbish to say that. Um, they are acts of love, they are worth, they are valuable in themselves. All these things. They are not instrumentalized towards the greater good of them becoming Christians. Um, I, I would say at least. Now to an extent I would say this, maybe we should look at mission in the same way. All these things we do in, in terms of mission. Uh, witnessing to Christ, if, uh, inviting people to, to follow Christ and so on. Um, uh, building the food banks and whatever, um, influencing the government, whatever, what have you. Um, all these things are not instrumentalized towards the greater good. They are acts of worship in themselves, acts of love, because love and worship are very close to each other as far as, far as I'm concerned. Um, so maybe we need a new language there. Some, I tend to think that sometimes. The, the language of mission has often been militaristic, right? Uh, 
since the late 19th century, it was all about mission fields that need to be conquered and territories that need to be occupied and so on. Uh, armies of missionaries being sent out. Now, um, somewhere in the middle of the 20th century, uh, especially after the two world wars, we tended to become a bit suspicious about militaristic language and crusades and so on. Um, so we started to, to adopt the language of business, right? Uh, projects, uh, time paths, uh, budgets, and so on. Uh, targets, task groups, what have you. Uh, maybe we need, but all these, so this, this language is, I think, very susceptible to, to, to instrumentalization. So what about the language of art, for example? Um, maybe our mission is, is about making art, to give people something to think about, to create pointers towards God's future. Um, signs and foretastes rather than instruments. Conversions and transformations, because some things do change, at least for a while. They are signs of the kingdom, pointers to God's future. They inspire hope and joy. Uh, maybe that's a way to think about a mission as a work of art rather than conquest or building businesses. Anyway. Um, my second theological key thought about post-Christian omission would be uh, the question, well, a very basic question actually, what is God doing in all this? Um, especially, what is God doing in the secularization of our cultures? Now maybe that's a question you've never asked or dared to ask. Or maybe you say well, it's unanswerable, maybe. But still, I believe that we need to ask questions like that, uh, even if we don't, do not really have the answers. Not asking those questions or thinking that this is an obsolete question or whatever, that may be uh, the best sign of the secularization of our mindset that we can think of. If we don't ask the question anymore, what God has to do with the development in our culture, and especially this one, the decline of the churches, the loss of faith, the secularization of our cultures. What has God to do with it? Well, my best take on this, uh, I, I did my PhD in Old Testament studies, so maybe it's a sort of a natural reflex for me, is to look back in the Old Testament to the to traditions of exile and diaspora. Not to compare this one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, the, the, the Israelite exile in, in the 6th century before Christ was, was in many ways different from our situation, but there are similarities. And to an extent, you could say maybe that we are closer to their experiences than our own ancestors. Our own ancestors lived in an unbroken Christian culture, where Christianity was sort of self-evident. The prophets in the Old Testament, they lived much more contested lives. Their faith was ridiculed all the time. Uh, they lived among, in a world where superior gods seemed to rule. I mean, their god had lost the fight, the battle. They were carried into exile. And, and, and so one of the things I think to need, we need to point out is that the crisis of exile was a crisis of faith. I mean, God's promises were broken. The promise of the land, the promise of the dynasty. I mean, David and his sons would, would be always on the throne. And what happened? I mean, and then, uh, of course, the promise of the temple, that God would uh, let his name dwell there for, forever. And then the Babylonians came over the walls, and they burned the temple down, they killed the king, and they carried the people off into exile. That was it. Crisis of faith, people. Uh, it's, 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 it's huge. Now, what we see there um, is, of course, a lot of trauma. Think of the Book of Lamentations. God has abandoned us. God may not exist at all. Other gods may be superior. You see even sort of mockery with God. Think of Lamentations chapter 2, where there is a sort of parody on Psalm 23. He has not been a good shepherd to us. Not at all. Um, you see probably people losing the faith. That, uh, we see some signs of that in the Book of Jeremiah, where people go off to Egypt and say, well, we forget about God, we'll be serving the Queen of Heaven again because she took care of us much better than, than Yahweh. And then um, there's all sorts of terms of explanation also. Uh, the Deuter uh, Deuteronomistic tradition in, in the Old Testament. We have sinned. Our ancestors have sinned. God is judging us. Um, that may be an important thing for the church today to think about. We have a lot to confess, I would say, thinking back a few centuries. Um, so maybe there's truth in that as well. And then there's new horizons, because 
When you see, for example, the second Isaiah in the book of Daniel, you see discoveries that this is God's world after all. Daniel and his friends are, 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 are taken prisoner, they are carried away to, to Babylon, and then they meet, the first person they meet is a, a, an official, a court official uh, from uh, Nebuchadnezzar, who sort of makes place for them. He's a man of peace, Jesus would say in Luke chapter 10. One of these persons of peace who make place for the people of God without becoming Christians, without becoming Jews, and we don't read that these people were converted at all, but they, they sort of there's sign, signs of God. Ways in which God approaches the, the faithful community out of the world. And counters them out of the world. And say, you're welcome here. <laughs> um, so, so what the people of Israel discovered in exile is, is this, I suppose. That God is not our God. He is not the possession of our tribe. Or our history. Our church. Our nation. He is the God of the ends of the earth. Do you not know? Isaiah chapter 40. Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. So there's this new right. I suppose, um, might we ask, is there a new chapter for the church in Europe? We don't know, but there's good hope that there is one. And probably... The way to open the chapter, or to have the chapter opened by God or by the Spirit, is to get uprooted to some extent. To be broken away from, from our roots, from our traditions, uh, the possessions of the past, the securities of the past. So, so I suppose this lesson about that God is really the God of all the earth, that this world is God's world after all, is often learned the hard way. God has not abandoned us. Not at all. That's what Israel learned in exile. But they had to lose a lot to learn that. I think exile and diaspora is also important words to make sense of the very different experience that Christians can have also in a culture like this one. What I see in the Netherlands at least, and I suppose it's more or less similar in, in the UK, is that there is differences here between the older generation and the, and the newer generation. So the older generations is often... Um, a predominant idea of, of trauma, of, of loss, sadness. Back then the churches were still full. Back then all of the street went up on Sunday mornings to the church and stuff like that. And now we're the only ones. My children are even not going anymore and so on. Um, and then there's diaspora. That's when people get used to it, basically. A few generations on. When uh, the experience of being a minority, the experience of being aliens or strangers in the world, um, you find it in, in, in the Bible as well, as, in the book of Ezra, right? Beautiful text there. Many of the older priests and Levites and family heads, when the temple was, was restored, or at least some form of temple, they had seen the former temple, and they wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. That can happen. That's the confusion of a post-Christendom society as well, I suppose. No one could distinguish the, sound of, the shouts of joy from the sounds of weeping. That's what I often see in the Dutch churches, actually. When you look at the younger and the older generations. It's very confusing. Because the people made so much noise. And the sound was heard far away. Yeah. So to be in exile is to be a stranger, a minority. I think that's the most important thing to say. It does not necessarily mean that you're hated or discriminated against. Think of Daniel, he became a minister. Think of uh, Queen Esther, Queen, I mean... Think of, uh, in the earlier days, Joseph, he became a viceroy and so on. So it's not that you can't make a career, that, you, that you're not respected or, or, or can become very wealthy or successful or whatever. But the point is, as, a, as an alien, as a pilgrim, as a stranger, you do not have the power to arrange culture in such a way that, that life becomes just a bit easier for you and your fellow faithful people than for others. That's basically, we do not rule the, cu the culture anymore. We don't own it anymore. That's... I suppose, what being a pilgrim or a stranger is all about. So it's not about sort of defeatism, a sort of, oh, uh, we are such, uh, well, we discriminated against and people hate us and all this kind of culture war stuff. That's not what I'm talking about. Uh, that can happen. I mean, that's also the experience of, of the Israelites in exile. 
uh, the book of Daniel, for example, uh, Daniel chapter 1, King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream and, 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 uh, and, and Daniel explains it to him. And then the king says, all the world should worship the God of Daniel. Well, that's nice. And then the next chapter, the king sets up a huge statue of himself and he says, all the world should worship me. Basically, that's, that's what it means to live in, in exile. The world can change all of a sudden. It's not necessarily against you, but it can happen. And you, don't, you can't do much about it, basically. You don't rule it anymore. That's what it means to be a stranger. But then, that can also be a point of departure for a, for a very positive mission, mission right? Um, and then, so my next step would be the letter of Peter, the first letter of Peter in the New Testament, where he addresses the church, uh, the Christians who have been dispersed all over the world um, as exiles, basically. He, he addresses them as foreigners, as exiles. Uh, friends, I urge you, as foreigners and exiles, but then he also gives them a sort of positive image of what it means to, be, to, be, to do mission in a culture like that, as aliens, as foreigners. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And Peter refers there to Exodus 19, of course, where the people of Israel are called a royal priesthood, called out of the world to serve the world as priests. Now, as far as I'm concerned, priesthood may be the key metaphor to understand our existence as a missional minority in a secular culture. Priests, what, what does a priest do? I mean, I'm not talking about ordained priesthood here. I, I know that's a thing in, in the UK, not so much in my church, but I'm talking about a sort of generic priesthood, the priesthood of the people of God. Now, priests, in the first place, are, are mediators. They're in between people, right? Um, they're called out of the world to mediate between the world and God. Uh, that's what the people of Israel was in the Old Testament. They were called out of the world to be assigned to the nations. And that, I suppose, is what Peter means when he says to the church, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. You are called out of the world for mission. Um, they're standing between the world and God. Priests represent God before their cities and, na and neighborhoods. And they represent their cities and neighborhoods before God. That's what I would say. It's the key to the priesthood. So this mutual uh, reciprocal uh, representation. To represent God before the people. Represent your people before God. Now, what does it mean? Well, you look in the Bible, in the Old Testament, for example. What priests do is, basic, is very basic. When they represent God before their people, they teach them. And they bless them. Basically, that's what you do as a priest. You teach and you bless. So you pass through the word of God in whatever way. And you bless, you seek the good of the people. You want to bless them. Um, and, and when they represent the people before God, what they do is worship and sacrifice. I gave some examples here. So it's out of, it's, you, you're drawn out of sort of competition with the world here, right? You, you're, you don't say, well, there's so much beauty and goodness in the world, does God even exist? Apparently you don't need God to be good. Um, which is a sort of, source of doubt for those Christians who want to transform and compete with other people. But if you're a priest, you're basically happy with every good and, 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 and beautiful thing you see. And you thank God for it. That's your job as a priest. You gather gratitude and lamentation and you offer it to God. You do intercession and all, this, all these things. Now, just for closing point out a few characteristics of this royal priesthood. First, I would say priests are a minority by definition. It's a minority image, right? Now I have to work that out. I suppose that makes sense. Uh, so this approach of mission does not depend on size and, and the impact of the Christian community. You can do it with three people in a senior home, or you can do it with 3,000 people in some suburb, whatever. Um, also, I would say this gives us a more hopeful perspective on evangelism and social ministry. Um, it does not end when people say no. So take uh, uh, evangelism, for example. Uh, many of you, I suppose, uh, have invited their neighbors to come to church or to, to your pioneer ministry or whatever. They have tried to connect, they invited people to follow Jesus or whatever. Now, some people say yes, they do that. Maybe some of you in the room have that history. Uh, many say no, or they say yes and they do no. That's what happens to me a lot. Um, uh, my wife is different. She's more the gift of evangelism. Um, I have the desire for evangelism. That's a different thing. Anyway, um, so, so um, um, 
if these people say no, for, in, in a sort of church growth oriented approach, that would be the end of the story, right? You can ask again and again, but then, it, well, then they kick you out of the door. So, so uh, it stops somewhere. But if you're a priest, it doesn't stop there. Because you still can carry them before God. You can represent them, so to speak. Um, so I've, I've had a lot of wonderful conversations with my neighbour. She's, she's a wonderful lady, she's a Buddhist. Um, she doesn't want to become a Christian. I've asked it once, twice, but then it stops. I mean, you need to be polite and so on. Um, so so uh, we have all these wonderful conversations about life and sharing a lot of stuff. And sh she has now the intention to set up a, a home, a sort of foster parents' home, where she will welcome children without parents or play, uh, placed out of home or whatever reason. Um, and, and she spends a lot of money on that. And so very, she's a very good woman. Anyway, so sometimes I ask her, so, do you have any new plans for this week? And is it okay if we pray for you in church? So, or can we thank for you in church? Because that doesn't happen very much, that people thank for you, give God thanks for you. Uh, sometimes they want to pray for you, but do you ever thank for people? Uh, so, and, and she is touched by that, because she says, that doesn't happen a lot to me. Um, so that's what priests do, I suppose. Uh, they don't compete with the world. Their sense of identity and their confidence is not rooted in the conviction of being better or more successful at transforming the world. It is rooted in a calling. Um, and I say, this is not a, a, an image that closes the church off from the world around it. On the contrary, it invites you to really go for, to establish loving relationships uh, without a sort of recruitment agenda in the background which often, relationships can also be approached very instrumentally. Uh, no, everything can come from that. If you share life in it on a deep level, then sometimes people will be changed as far as you can tell, sometimes they won't as far as you can tell, but you still are their priest. So you share everyday life um, without hidden agendas, and you ask things like, can I pray for you, can, I, can we... Can I thank for you? Would you do it yourself? Would I do it for you? Um, all this kind of stuff can, can happen. And then I would say this makes sense because it is rooted in a deep understanding of community. Priesthood is a collective metaphor. I understand that you will be talking in the seminars a bit about do you, ever, do you even need church to do the mission and so on. I would say yes. <laughs> uh, just make my stand here. Um, priesthood is a collective metaphor. You need each other, basically. It's a communal thing. So, um, and it also shows, and I think that's an important antidote to the deep individualization of our own culture, also Christian culture. Um, it also shows that you can approach God on behalf of those whom you represent. That's a difficult thing to say in, in a Western society because even Christians all think that we all need to have our individual, individual high quality relationship with God, right? Um, we, we do not tend to think that others can have faith for you, so to speak, or carry you before God if you have, well, lots of doubts or do not, are not so sure about your faith, if you have any at all. Um, that's a very difficult thing to say uh, in a Western culture, but it is important to make that point, especially in our culture. Maybe not in Korea, that's collective enough, but here in the West, I think it's an important point to make. Um, for example, uh, so, so if, if you are the only one in the street, so to speak, who goes to church, who goes to worship, because not, uh, not going to a building, but I mean, going for worship, going where priests do, uh, sacrifice and so on, you're not going just for yourself, right? You're going for the street, you're going for your neighbours, going for your children, you're going for your parents. Um, and and if, if, you, if you read through this collective lens, this more communal lens, to scripture, some texts start to make sense as well that we often tend to ignore as, as, as individualized people. For example, I put it on the handout, Job. We all know Job as, as the suffering figure. He was also the, the, the sort of proverbial righteous figure. In, in Job chapter 1, he is pictured as, as a righteous man. And why is he righteous? Well, among other things, because of this. He sacrificed for his children. His sons used to hold feasts in their homes on their birthdays, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when a period of feasting had run its course, Job, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. It doesn't say that he asked his children for permission, right? He just did it on behalf of them as a priest. Now, New Testament, 
even more interesting and thing that, things that especially more orthodox or individualized evangelicals and so cannot make sense of. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 about marriage. If a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband, there it comes, has been sanctified through his wife. And the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. Now this is communal thinking. So as long as you have the idea that God has primarily a relationship with individuals, that was my alarm clock, so, but I'll wrap it up in one minute. So as long as you, as you have the idea that God has a, a relationship with individuals in the first place, the church will always be secondary, right? Because everything that needs to happen between God and people has happened already in individual relationship. So a church comes in handy, maybe, can be functional when individuals come together, because together you can do more than just on your own. But it is not really necessary. You don't need it for anything. It comes handy. It's functional. Um, if God has a relationship with communities in the first place, and through the community, or through the church in this case, with me, then things become different. And I would say the picture we see in the New Testament, in the Bible, I don't want to exaggerate, I don't want to push it to the completely collective version, but I'd say in our culture it's important to emphasize this a little bit more. That God may have a relationship with the church in the first place, and through the church with us individuals. This, which also means that we can carry each other. Which also means that maybe we are carried by the faith of other people, by their priesthood. And that those who, 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 whom we are in loving relationships with, outside the church, wherever, uh, are carried also. We don't know how far this extends. I mean, we know where it begins, salvation. I don't know where it ends. I don't have to know. But I know, it, I know where it begins, and I know that apparently God is willing to carry other people through my faith and me through the faith of other people, to some extent at least. I know that it counts for something. I'm not trying to be sort of armchair theologian who wants to decide who is in and who is out. That's not the point I'm trying to make here. I hope that's clear. I just want to say, we can be more hopeful than we think. Right? Um, yeah. I'll leave it there, because there should be some room for Q&A. Um, any questions? Or you will later, I'll probably. Thank you, thank you.